because uh, I'm going to leave early. I'm going to leave about. Ten minutes early, and I made this more than that. Um, picking up, finishing ministers like fail. A couple of quick comments. Um, I put up a quiz this morning. It will be live at noon today. It'll be due Tuesday evening, 11.59, so that gives you however many days that is. Four, five, ten, five, seven, five days. Um, at five, uh, 11.59 p.m., 20 multiple choice questions, 10 extra credit questions. You have 25 minutes total. Uh, like I said, it's multiple choice. That's why I don't give you, you know, a minute for each one because and you're done. Um, automatically graded so you'll know, you know, immediately as soon as you hit submit. Um, it covers fiction terms, Minister's Black Veil, and Barn Burning. Hopefully we'll get, not through Barn Burning, because I didn't finish it with my first class, but we'll get um, into it. What I say in class, uh, for the most part, doesn't show up on the quiz. I mean, it's pretty... Objective. People, places, events, who, what, why, when, where, you know, how kind of questions. Okay? Um, it's worth 20 points. As I said, 10 points extra credit. Okay? Let's see. So we left off, whatever day that was, Wednesday, on page 335, Minister, I think Minister is Blackville, and Person Hooper is talking with his fiance. Elizabeth has come by. Okay, nobody else in town will talk to him about why he's wearing the veil, but she does. And we saw her. You know, she comes in and she says, "Lay aside the veil. There's nothing horrible, terrible about it." Middle of twenty-five. And he says, "Nope, can't." There's an hour to come when all of us will cast aside our veils. Take it not amiss, beloved friend, if I wear this piece of crepe till then. And she says. Don't understand. What do you mean? Your words are a mystery. I think she means, what do you mean there is a time, a time, an hour coming when we will all cast aside our veils? When we die. It doesn't mean we literally go, there, free at last, you know. You die, the flesh rots, and the soul goes wherever. Okay? That's what he's referring to. So she says, take away the veil from them. That is, the obscurity, the thing that's hiding the meaning of them. Make it clear. Remember, this is a parable. Let him who has ears to hear, hear. Let him who has eyes to see, see. Okay? And he says, I will, as far as my vow may suffer me. What vow? Who do you make a vow to? Do we hear this vow? No, we don't. It's assumed the vow is between him and God, okay? So he says, this veil, words I had right here on the board the other day, is a type and symbol. Type is like a foreshadowing, a prefiguring. And I, I think we barely got to this the other day. And I mentioned three Old Testament biblical characters who were all types, foreshadowing, prefiguring, so to speak, of Christ, Okay. You had Moses, who was the deliverer, the savior. He led the Israelites, the Hebrews, out of Egypt into the promised land. He didn't get to the promised land because he screwed up. All right? So he is a type, a prefigurement of Jesus because Jesus leads, according to Christian theology, leads uh, Christians out of Egypt, sin, bondage to sin, into the promised land. Freedom from sin, heaven, etc. Okay? And then you have, I had uh, Moses, Samson, delivered the Israelites from the power or authority of the Philistines after he, you know, destroyed their temple of Dagon, killing himself in the process. So even that is kind of, that's even more suggestive of Christ than is Moses. 
He sacrifices himself, Samson does, but he doesn't rise from the dead, okay, because he's not Jesus. And then David, killing Goliath, freeing again the Israelites from the power of the Philistines and such. But Jesus doesn't go around sleeping with women who are bathing on the tops of houses next door like David does. That's why every one of the types, every one of the prefigurements has a flaw, okay? They point to, that's all it is. They point to something in the future. So he says it's a type and a symbol. And we've talked about symbol, and he means symbol in pretty much the same way. Something that can, again, point to something else. So we will cast aside our veils. Well, nobody in here is wearing a veil right now. So what is he talking? It's got to be something else. So you have to start looking at the context. And he says, when we will cast aside our veils... Uh, there is an hour to come when all of us shall cast aside our veil. Take it not amiss if I wear this piece of crape till then. He doesn't say when that then is, but later on. The veil is a type and a symbol. I'm bound to wear it ever, both in light and darkness, solitude, and before the gaze of multitudes, as with strangers, so with my familiar friends. Okay? What's his point? I will never take this veil off. Should we marry, Elizabeth, you will never see me without this veil. When I take a bath, I'm wearing the veil. When we make love, I will be wearing the veil. That probably gives her the creeps a little bit. Okay? No mortal eye will see it withdrawn. This dismal shade, the word dismal means darkened, shadowed. So this shady shade, this dismal dismality, you know, must separate me from the world. Even you can never come behind it. And she says, what happened? What affliction have She's assuming something happened. This is, you know, today we would say, this is PTSD. He's, he's hiding something, okay? If it be a sign of mourning, notice he's not saying it is, but if it is a sign of mourning, I, like most other mortals, have sorrows dark enough to be typified by a black veil. That is, the black veil can point to those sorrows. It is not the sorrows themselves. Okay? So, that's one possibility. It's emblematic, to use the word that's used earlier, it's emblematic of hidden sorrow. And she says, but what if the world doesn't think it's an innocent sorrow? <clears throat> like his sorrowing for racism and prejudice and hunger and poverty and all the ills of the world. I mean, he could put it on for that. She says, that would be kind of an innocent sorrow. What if people don't think it's that? What if they think... You've got some dark secret sin. What if they think you've done something you shouldn't have done? And you're embarrassed by it. You're ashamed by it. What often happens when you see somebody get arrested and they're being perp walked, you know, to the squad car? If there's cameras and everything there, they often do this. Why? They don't want their faces to be seen. Well, put on a veil. Nobody will see you. If I hide my face for sorrow, there is cause enough. He goes back to that. And then he says, and if I cover it for secret sin, what mortal might not do the same? What's his point? Let he who has, uh, what does Christ say when they bring him to the woman caught in adultery? Let him who is without sin cast the first stone. And all the men, because it's described as being, damn it. And here we were going to have a good stoning. You know, we're not talking, you know, stoning in biblical times. We're not talking little rocks. 
We're talking people but picking up like cobblestones. And so the person, you go and you, I mean, you bash their heads in. You break the bones. And that's how they die. It's not like that, okay? If I'm wearing it for secret sin, who out there couldn't also wear one for secret sin? In other words, the veil then becomes like, I'm hoping this doesn't come on, becomes like a mirror. Okay. He resists all her entreaties. And she sits there and looks at him, top of page 336, and we're told that the last sentence of the first, second to last sentence of that paragraph at the top. In an instant, as it were, a new feeling took the place of sorrow. Her eyes were fixed insensibly on the black veil. That is, it's like she's not even aware, but she is focused on that veil. When, like a sudden twilight in the air, its terrors fell around her. She's so focused on it, it's like what happens to her. The veil drops. She now has the veil on. Or a veil on. She arose and stood trembling before him. And do you feel it then at last? What's the it? The terrors of the veil. Okay. What is what, what's being implied when she feels it? Okay, she's so focused on it, it's like that's all she sees now is the veil. What where is the veil in relation to Parson Hooper and Elizabeth? Okay. Parson Hooper. This is the face. This is a face. Parson Hooper, Elizabeth. Where's the veil? It's between them. It's separating them. It would be like if I were to ask all of you right now, step outside and kind of line up outside this wall. And I'll stay here. Let's try and have a conversation. Let's try and talk. Why are you shaking your head? You can't. Why? Because of that wall. Okay, the veil is like a wall. I don't have it. Don't have that written here. Why? In nearly thirty years of teaching this story, I've never thought of it as a wall. I thought of it as a separation, but not a wall. And do you feel it then at last? She covers her eyes. She starts to leave. He says, "Have patience." Why? She's the love of his life. They're engaged. They're supposed to get married. Do not desert me, though this veil must be between us here on earth. Be mine, and hereafter there shall be no veil over my face, no darkness between our souls. When is the hereafter he's talking about? In the great hereafter, the big hereafter, then, he's saying, in death, what? We will know each other perfectly, completely, wholly. Why? Because now, I've been married 37 years. Hawthorne is suggesting we don't see face to face. It's like, got a mask on and my wife has a mask on it might be intentional it might be unintentional but he's saying when we are dead how does he put it there will be no veil over my face no darkness between our souls it's like his soul will be fully illuminated for her and her soul will be fully illuminated for him see what does this imply about the, about marriage? You know, it's, it's often thought of, you know, a lot of Protestant weddings have vows, till death do us part. Well, in the older ceremonies of the church, there was no such vow. 
Because death, according to Judeo-Christian tradition, at least up until 1500 or so, death didn't separate. It was merely, as J.K. Rowling puts it in an ep uh, epigraph to one of her books, it's merely a separation. But then, once both are dead, that relationship continues for all eternity. But then, to this, you're known better, right? And she says, lift the veil but once. One time, let me see your face. <laughs> Why? <laughs> Prove that it's you. It's almost what she's saying. I need to know it's really you. Never. It cannot be. Bye. <laughs> and she leaves. Okay? Skip to the end. So, Parson Hooper's lying on his deathbed now. What kind of preacher has he been in the intervening 30, 40, 50? We're not told how long. How many years? He's gone from being a middling, middle of the road, your average preacher, to he packs the church. People come from far and wide to hear his sermons. Why? Because they convict. They really make you feel what he's talking about. So now he's lying on his deathbed. And the Reverend Mr. Clark, the minister of Westbury, is there with him, and other kind of notable men of the church, other elders, so to speak. And he says, Venerable Father Hooper, the moment of your release is at hand. You're about to die. You're about to meet Jesus. Are you ready for the lifting of the veil? See, he understands biblical, what's called biblical typology. Biblical language to use one thing to refer to something else. The lifting of the veil. The lifting of the thing that separates us from the here and now, the physical world, from seeing the eternal, the unphysical world, the spiritual world. But notice what he calls him, Venerable Father Hooper. Venerable, venerable means worthy of veneration. That's raised above the common level in high, great respect. It's not worship. Okay, Catholics, I'm not Catholic. Catholics venerate Mary. They don't worship her. Why? Only God, only the Trinity is worthy of worship. So, Venerable, and then he calls him Father Hooper. In the Puritan tradition, which this is in, you don't call a minister father. Why? You only call God father. You're right. Jesus says, call no man father. That's why. Okay? And one interpretation of that is Jesus says, call no man father, because he'll say later, Paul will say later in Ephesians or Galatians or something like that, there is one father, God, from whom all fatherhood flows. That is, usually father is, is taken to be a metaphor. And Paul said, no, there is a father, there is one, and every other image of fatherhood derives from that. So, Venerable Father Hooper, you're about to die. Lift the veil. And he kind of nods because he's feeble and dying. Yeah, my soul at the patient weariness until that veil be lifted. My soul, patient weariness, I'm tired. I want to die. You know, even so come quickly, you know, Lord Jesus, end of Revelation. Stop it. And it is, is it fitting that a man so given a prayer of such blameless example, holy in deed and thought, so far as mortal judgment, you know, as far as we can tell, you're a holy person. That's why he's venerable. You venerate holy people. I don't think many people would go around, I don't mean to pick on anybody, this, you know, but would not go around and venerate, I don't know, pick some TikToker, YouTube star who's known for not holy living, you know, Kanye or Kim Kardashian, you know, 
Not, not the most pure life, let's say. All right? Is it fitting a father in the church should leave a shadow on his memory? What's the shadow? It's the literal shadow, the veil. So before you die, what's he say? Lift the veil. Let us look at your face. Otherwise, people are going to think he was hiding something till his death. Okay. And so he leans down. Father Hooper is on his bed, deathbed. And Minister Clark leans down to grab the veil and reveal his face. Never on earth, never. Dark old man. With what horrible crime upon your soul are you now passing to the judgment? Dark old man, unfathomable, unknowable, ununderstandable. What are you hiding? He's saying, this is your chance, man. Admit the sin. Confess it. And Father Hooper, and he reaches up and he grabs that veil and he pulls it down. Why do you tremble at me alone, he says. Tremble at each other. And he turns, lying in bed, you know, like this, and he looks at everybody. He says, don't tremble at me. Tremble when you look at each other. Have men avoided me, and women shown no pity, and children screamed and fled only for my black veil. Really? Is that it? This stupid piece of cloth has kept everybody from having any contact with me. It's pretty damning language. What but the mystery which it obscurely typifies. Mystery obscurely typifies. Three loaded words. Mystery, something that cannot be understood, something that cannot be resolved. Okay, Obscurely, darkly, think of your vision and you get something in your eye. What do you do? You kind of wink and you do this and you can't see as well. It's, it's blocking the vision. Typifies, points to. So this dark, hidden mystery is pointed to by the veil. What has made this piece of crepe so awful? Notice this piece of crepe. It's just a piece of crepe. When the friend shows his inmost heart to his friend, the lover to his best beloved, when man does not vainly shrink from the eye of his creator, loathsomely treasuring up the secret of his sin. Remember the first time he preached wearing the veil? What effect did it have on everyone from the most innocent girl to the most hardened old geezer? Like he snuck up behind him and said, Gotcha. Seeing the thing that they loathsomely hoard. Then, so, when two best friends totally are honest with each other, totally, 100%, no, nothing hidden, when two lovers completely reveal all their thoughts and emotions to each other, when the person stops trying to hide from God. The one thing that the person wants to say, mine. Then, he says, then deem me a monster for the symbol beneath which I have lived and die. When's that going to happen? When are those three things going to occur? Not. Not in this life. Why? How much do we know, individually, according to psychologists, if you want, of our subconscious? Very little. That's why it's subconscious. It's buried. He's talking about when the subconscious becomes conscious. When those things we're not aware of, we become aware of. Why is it, why are there certain things, certain, whatever, certain things that are in our subconscious? Because 
because we don't want to deal with them. We bury them. We repress them. That's why somebody who undergoes a horrific event needs to deal with it. At that point, you try to bury it, and what will happen? Eventually, it will creep its ugly, rotten, foul head up. And then you'll have to deal with it. PTSD. Often PTSD is delayed. It's, it doesn't happen at the moment. It happens a year later, two years later, 20 years later. Okay? I look around me and lo, on every visit, what does he mean? I'm not the one wearing the black veil. Ashton is. You guys are. You've all got black veils. Not you personally. Within the context of the story. What does he mean? Louder? Something to hide. You're all hiding things. Quit being dishonest with each other. Open up. In other words, we all have hidden guilt, hidden sin, that what? Needs to be dealt with somehow. Okay? All right, stop there. So, you know, the veil represents a whole bunch of different things. So, stop there and go to Faulkner. We have, I've got about 20 minutes. Because I, if you came in a few minutes late, I need to leave early. I need to leave by 9.55. Uh, doctor's appointment that they had to move up. Um, nope, not there. So, Faulkner, Barn Burden, just very, very brief um, background. This is uh, page 406. In this one, I think it's three, 476 in the 10th edition. Um, Faulkner was a novelist, wrote some essays, wrote some, like this one, short stories. There's another short story in here. Rose for Emily, kind of creepy, very weird. Um, Faulkner did write a lot of weird stuff, like in one of his novels, he's got one of the narrators is a dead lady. As I Lay Dying, one of the narrators is dead. It's got multiple narrators. Okay? Um, Faulkner's a master of what's called Southern fiction, Southern lit. You know, there's multiple characteristics, the chief one being they're set in the South, and one of the other really major ones is you have a figure or element of the grotesque, right? It might be physically, like somebody who is physically misshapen slash deformed. At the very least, you have characters who are mentally, emotionally, spiritually, intellectually, internally misshapen and deformed. If you've read Barn Burning, you believe I asked you to, Abner Snopes is definitely, there's something wrong inside. Okay? So you've got that. Um, Faulkner, often in his novels, has the action occur in this county, Yachnapatafa, which he invents. It's not a real county in Mississippi. It's very realistic. Okay? And pretty much all of his novels are primarily set in Mississippi, he does have a couple where, where people are elsewhere for a while. Like one guy goes off to a university, Harvard or Yale or somewhere like that in the Northeast. But he's always got the South pulling back at him. Okay? A major thing you're going to see in Hawthorne, uh, not Hawthorne, Faulkner, 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 is the emphasis on family. Or what is termed in here as the pull of blood. Family cohesion, family connectedness, that you got to stick with your family. In fact, we're going to hear Abner tell his youngest son, you got to stick with family, because if you don't, you won't have anyone to stick with you. Family is everything. Question to ask is, is it? I mean, my siblings all think this 100%. You know, family's what? Family you got to live with, right? You don't get a choice in the matter, so to speak. Well, maybe you do. 
what if your family's bet you know what crazy? You you better get out of there. So it opens. The store in which the justice of the peace's court was sitting smelled of cheese. It's not a court, it's a store, it's a general store. So it's like the county's so poor, it doesn't have a courthouse. The boy, crouched on his nail keg at the back of the crowded room, knew he smelled cheese and more. He knew he smelled cheese. Notice the narrator doesn't just say he smelled cheese. He knew he smelled cheese. Why, why the intellectual assertion? It may be because he's not literally, literally smelling it. Okay? But he, he, he's pretty sure he does. But is, is that cheese? From where he said he could see the ranked shelves, that's packed shelves, close packed with solid squat dynamic shapes of tin cans whose labels his stomach read. Not from the lettering, which meant nothing to his mind. Why? He can't read. He's illiterate. But from the scarlet devils and the silver curve of fish. He can see the emblems on the cans. Like a picture of a fish. And he knows that means fish. Like tuna fish. Okay? This... The cheese, which he knew he smelled, and the, lost my place, hermetic meat, which his intestines believed he smelled, hermetic, sealed, no scent, no odor can get out of these cans. So why do his intestines think he smells meat? Louder. He's that hungry. He sees that meat and his stomach churns. You can probably be probably safe to say this kid is starving. That's why he thinks he smells cheese. That he believed he smelled coming in intermittent gusts, momentary and brief, between the other constant one. So these aromas, so to speak come to him intellectually okay. in between this one constant intellectual thing. Don't know what that thing is yet. The other constant smell. The smell and sense just a little of fear. Does fear have a smell? Literally? Maybe, maybe not. Animals can sense fear. Okay. Probably because they sense pheromones, odors that the body is giving off. The old um, sense and smell of fear because mostly of despair and grief. What is mostly because of despair and grief? The old fierce pull of like there is a rope connecting his father whom we don't know where he is at this point or about whom we don't know where he is. Okay? Connecting his father to the boy. That is the one constant smell in his life. It's the one constant to his existence. He could not see the table where the justice sat and before which his father, and then we have his father introduced, and his father's enemy. Notice parentheses in italics. Our, does it have the hour? No, it doesn't there. Our enemy. His father's enemy becomes what? The boy's enemy. I mean, this is like the Sopranos or any mafia movie. You touch one of mine, you touch me. Okay? Our enemy. He thought, in that despair, what's the despair? That old fierce pull of blood. That creates despair in this child. Do we know why yet? 
How many of you immediately feel despair when you think of a loved one, not boyfriend, girlfriend, someone you're related to? Hopefully not. If the first thing when you think mom is despair, you guys need some counseling. There's something wrong there. Unless maybe your mom was an abuser or your father, whatever. Okay. But he could hear them. He could hear his father. He could hear he could hear the enemy and the justice of the peace. Because his father hadn't said anything yet. So we hear the justice of the peace. But what proof have you, Mr. Harris? That is, what's the evidence? I told you the hog got into my corn. I caught it up, I sent it back to him. His, the enemies, the boy's father's, hog got into Mr. Harris's field. What do hogs do with corn stalks? They trample them down, they eat the corn. This is eating literally into his living, right? He says, I caught the hog, I sent it back. I warned him. He had no fence that would hold it. I told him so, warned him. The next time, I put the hog in my pen. So, it's happened twice. When he came to get it, I gave him enough wire to patch up his pen. Is that the action of an enemy? No. Mr. Harris, out of his own pocket, provides the father with enough fence wire to fix his pen so that the hog won't get out. That's merciful. That's compassionate. That's being a good neighbor, you know. The next time, third time, I put the hog up and kept it. Notice what he doesn't do. He doesn't take that hog and slit his throat and clean it and dress it. And hang it up, the meat up, in the smokehouse. He could. The hog's now broken into his field three times. He could. But he doesn't. I rode down to his house, saw the wire I gave him, still rolled on the spool in his yard. He doesn't give him just a little bit of wire. He gives him wire that is still on the spool. We're talking multiple feet of fence wire. Okay? I told him he could have the hog when he paid me a dollar pound fee. Notice, a dollar a day? No. A single buck. And so what happens? The father sends a servant with a buck to get his hog back. And the servant says, he said to tell you wood and hay can burn. Okay. So, what has Mr. Harris just done? What is this called in a court of law? He's repeated what somebody else has said. Hearsay. It's hearsay evidence. It cannot be used. So what does the Justice of the Peace ask for? Bring the person who said wood and hay can burn. He goes, I can't. I don't know where he is. Then we have no proof. We have no evidence. Mr. Harris says, get the boy. Get that boy up here. And so we find out the boy has an older brother. No, not him. The little one. And the little boy gets up and starts to walk up to the front of the store. And he thinks... End of that paragraph. He aims for me to lie, and I will have to do it. Who's the he? His father. He wants me to lie. What does that mean? I know the truth. What's the truth? Yeah. He sent the guy to say, wouldn't he can burn? What, what does that mean? Yeah. He burned down his barn. What's your name, boy? 
current Sartorius Snopes. Now, the Snopes family, not this one, but the larger Snopes family, the, the Snopes kin, figure largely in all of Faulkner's novels. Okay? They would be like, I don't know, uh, pick a modern and important or famous family in an area, you know, kind of a thing. Colonel Sartorius Snopes was a famous war hero in the Confederate, in the Confederate War, in the Civil War. So the boy is named after him. It would be like, you know, a parent naming a child in 1955 <coughs> after General Dwight Eisenhower. Okay, what's your name, boy? General Dwight Eisenhower Snopes. Oh, you're named after Eisenhower. You've got to tell the truth. That's exactly what his point. Okay. <coughs> Talk louder. I reckon anybody named for Colonel Sartorius in this country can't help but tell the truth, can they? What you just done? Boy, you better not lie. And the boy just thinks, enemy, enemy. Who's the enemy now? It's the justice of the peace. Has the justice of the peace done anything enemy like? No, he hasn't. Okay. And he turns there. Do you want me to question this boy? Why? Why does he ask that question? What does he know he's doing to this boy? Putting him in a very bad position. I mean, this is almost like torture. And Harris says, no, damnation, get him out of here. Would Harris win the case if the boy is called to testify? If the boy tells the truth. Yes, he would. But he doesn't want to put the boy through that. What, what does that tell us from the narrator's perspective about Harris and the justice of the peace? They're not enemies. These are good men. Okay. So, case closed. I find, can't find against you, Snopes. That is, I can't declare you guilty. But here's what I can do. Get out of my county. Leave this town. And Snopes says, for the first time he speaks, I aim to. I don't figure to stay in a country among people who and then the narrator says, he says some things that are unprintable and vile. That'll do. Take your way and get out. So the father turns, and as the father starts to go back out, you know, the line of the men part, and the boy's older brother steps forward also. So you have the boy's older brother first, I believe, then the father, then the boy comes out behind him. They come out of the building, they go out onto the porch, they're getting ready to go down the steps into the dirt, Dirt road, dirt streets. And somebody hisses, we're told what time of year it is. It's mid-May, or it's May, springtime, planting time. Barn burner. Again, he could not see whirling. Whirling is a present participle. It's modifying the subject. Whirling modifies the boy. Why can't he see? Because he's turning so fast and he's throwing a punch. Somebody called his father a barber. Fighting words, right? What happens to the boy? It's a crap beat out of him. Gets knocked down to the ground and he gets back up and he's ready to punch again. But the guy who decked him is already running away. Why? Because the boy is small and scrawny. His brother? He's not. <laughs> His brother is kind of small like his father, a little bit short, probably five, six or so. But he's muscular. Okay? Father grabs him, says, get in the wagon. So we're, we get the description of the wagon. Sits in a grove of locust trees, and who's in the wagon? Mom, her sister, and his two sisters. And they've all got on their Sunday best. What else do we see in the wagon? All of their earthly belongings. Now, you don't load everything up just to go to town, go to the courthouse. We're told 
Everything was sitting in it, sitting on, and the, his mother, sitting on or among the sorry residue of the dozen and more movings which even the boy could remember. They moved at least 12 times. We're going to be told a little bit later on, the boy is only 10 years old. They moved at least 12 times in those 10 years. Why is everything in the, in the wagon? They knew what was going to happen. The battered stove, the broken blah, blah, blah. Okay? The mother starts to come out of the wagon. Why? Her son's bleeding. She wants to take care of him. Get back in. Her husband says, he's hurt. i got to get back in the wagon. Okay? She has her boy's like, no, because he tries to act you know, big and tough. So they keep going, and then they eventually stop. Notice the boy doesn't know where they're going. Paragraph 25, top of page 408. None of them ever do. But he says, but the father had already gotten another position. Telling us, when the father burns the barn, what has he done before that? He's gotten another job lined up. So the burning of the barn, it's not a spur of the moment decision. It's not a crime of passion. It's premeditated. He knows exactly what he's going to do. And he knows exactly what the result is going to be. We're going to be kicked out of this town. So I better have another job. Does he work at Walmart? No, he's a sharecropper. So... He goes to a new plot of land. He's going to go work for a guy who owns a plot of land. Let's say it's 20 acres by 20 acres. So there's 400 acres to be farmed. Of that 400 acres, he might get an acre or maybe five acres to farm for himself. Whenever he gets off that little plot of land, he gets to keep. But for the other, the rest of it, okay, he has to produce a certain amount. Let's say the amount is 100 bushels of corn. If he only gets 95 bushels of corn from this, then he's got to provide the other five from his own little bit that he's allowed to have. He doesn't own this. Okay? So that means whatever he produces from that little bit of land, you got to take that five bushels out for the other guy. What if he only produces six? Then his family's got to be hungry. Opening up the story. That's why the boy is so hungry. Look at the description of the mules. They're thin and gaunt. So, I know, i got to stop. The boy, the father takes the boy off to the side and says, you were going to tell them the truth, weren't you? The boy doesn't answer. And then he says, yes, you got to stick, he says, you got to learn to stick to your own blood, paragraph 29, or you ain't going to have any blood to stick to you. Okay. We'll stop there. We'll pick up with that on Wednesday. No class on Monday because of Labor Day. Um, quiz over fiction terms, Hawthorne and Faulkner's Barn Birdie. We'll be live in about two hours. It's already posted and everything. Um, it is due Tuesday night, 11.59. It's multiple choice, 20 questions, plus 10 bonus questions. So it's worth 30 points that count. Uh, 20 points that count, 10 extra credit. Wake up. Have a good week.